Hi everyone and welcome to week 8. This week we're going to be talking about some more complex SQL commands or queries. We're going to be talking about using filters and some functions such as how to use ascending and descending to order some of our results using SQL. When we are looking at a database and we are using SQL to ask questions of our database, it is very common that our database is going to have multiple tables. We remember from before that a table is going to look similar to a spreadsheet where it's going to have a whole bunch of records. So it's going to have rows and columns. Each of these tables of data is going to be how we are organizing our information in our database. Each of these tables will have a primary key for each item or record. This primary key will be unique. When we are asking questions of our database, it is very common that we're going to have to do something called table joins. Having the ability to join tables means that we will be able to ask questions of our database that will take information from multiple tables. So like, for example, if we're talking about the books that we've been talking about for a while, we might have a books table and an authors table and a patrons table. And so we could join those tables together in different ways to be able to ask questions like, how many books has this author written that this patron has borrowed? Or if we keep track of which books are borrowed by a patron, we could ask what books has this patron been borrowing for the last six months? Or what is the most common author that this patron likes to read? So different things like that. When we are talking about the different tables, the relationship of the tables is going to be based on the primary key and the foreign key, just like we saw in the previous week. Joins are typically done between primary and foreign keys, but they can involve other values as well. To have a join, you need to have a related column. So if you don't have a related column between tables, as in how we are explaining what we're looking for in the table, you can't just say like the all of the authors and all of the books if they don't have an in common column. Um, we wouldn't be able to ask the correct question in the correct way. So we have to have a related column to be able to do this table join. Now, some examples of table joins. Um, so if we have a table of books and a table of library patrons, um, we could already know how to look at the contents of each table individually. We could manipulate the table individually. So we could ask questions, you know, what are, all of the library patrons or for example sorry about that uh, or we could say what books do we have or um, where are all of our library patrons named Susie like what town do they live in that kind of thing but adding in these joins will allow us to have more information such as who borrowed a book or a borrowing history or things like that so when we have table joins, we're going to talk about them more in depth later as well, but we can think of them starting very simply with just two tables. So if we have two tables, table one and table two, the way that the join is going to happen can be represented with um, Venn diagrams or sometimes you'll see it represented with larger tables or something. And so what you're looking at right now is a visual example of SQL joins. This may or may not be useful to you. If this doesn't make sense, don't worry. I'm going to have more examples of this next week. Um, but the different types of joins is going to be looking at the different types of matches. So for example, an outer join is going to look at all of the information on both tables, whereas an inner join is going to look at only the information that is on the first table and the second table. We can also do things like left and right joins where we would be looking at 
all of the information on the left table or table one, including anything that matches table two, or all of the information on table one, except what matches on table two, things like that. Now with SQL, we can also use filters to get more specific data because when we're looking at databases, we're not generally looking at, you know, 10 records or 100 records. We might be looking at 10,000 or 100,000 records or more. So the more that we can dial into exact pieces of information, the better. We don't want to have to ourselves visually go through the information. We want to make SQL do all of that work for us. So filters or groupings will allow us to get data out of the database and be more particular about the data that we're getting. For example, we could look at equal, not equal, greater than, less than. And these types of filters will allow us to do things like, for example, look for books that cost less than $10 or more than $5 or equal to $9.99. So for example, the query could be select splat or everything from books table where price is less than 10 or select splat or everything from books table where price equals $9.99. Now, as a quick little aside, sometimes it can be harder to do decimals with this variety of equivalents. This is just an example um, and this can absolutely be more complex. Um, but this is an example of a way that we could use SQL filters to be able to drill down even more to make sure that we are getting the very specific data that we want. We can also start adding in multiple options. So we could not just look for, you know, book price. We could drill down even more than that. If we use the AND or the or conditions, we are able to look for multiple things. So for example, if we wanted to look at books that cost less than $10 and were published in the last 10 years, we could say select splat or everything from books table where price is less than 10 and publish date is greater than 2015. And that would allow SQL to narrow it down even further for us. So it's not just books published in the last, you know, eight years or books that cost less than $10. It's both. And so it's only going to pull results that is going to have less than $10 and published in the last eight years. Uh, nine years, sorry. Um, we could use or here instead where price is less than 10 or published after 2015 and that would give anything that met either criteria instead of needing to meet both criteria. Another thing that we can do with SQL is something called SQL distinct. So this is going to look for unique items, so items without duplication. So one of the things that will sometimes happen in databases and in the tables is we might have pieces of information that are duplicates. They might have good reason for having duplicates, but maybe we don't want to see that for the particular book that we or patron or author or whatever it happens to be for that piece of data. We may want to only have unique records. Now, it might be that we actually um, might be looking for something like, let's say, for example, um, unique library patrons. So we want to look at addresses to make sure we're seeing unique addresses. So if we were, so if we look at our library example, if you have a library card, you probably have to renew your library card semi-frequently, maybe three years, five years, 10 years, whatever. And you have to live in the particular town or area that the library card is in. So it's possible that you might have multiple people from the same household within um, that all have library cards. But one of the things that we could do is we could look for sort of the distinct and make it, you know, distinct addresses. So only one person from each address pulls up. Um, or if we're looking at books. So if we have 
a library, we probably have multiple copies of the same book. And this could be the library system or the more general system. So like, for example, in Massachusetts, your town library might have a book, but then there's also the Minuteman system. And then there's probably duplicates in there. But let's say, for example, we wanted to look at a unique catalog. We wanted to do a distinct. So that means that we want to make sure that we don't have any duplicate books on the list. So like, let's say, for example, there's a 10 book series. And so we want to ask the database for all books by this author. And we want to use distinct to do it to make sure that we don't have duplicates. Because even if, you know, one's in Amesbury and one's in Methuen and one's down in Boston, like we don't care. We just want to make sure there's at least one in the Minuteman system. So we could use distinct to make sure that there's one of those books in the Minuteman system and make sure that there's one of each copy of the 10 series, um, the 10 set of books. So that way, if there isn't, we can say, you know, actually, hey, we're missing book eight. And the next time we get some money or a grant, we should go buy book eight um, to make sure that we have the full series in the system. So what library wants to hang on to book eight? So things like that. Now, another thing SQL can do is ascending and descending. So when we're looking at our data, we might want to find a way to organize our data in the results or the report that we're getting. So we can ask the database to give the results in a particular organizational pattern. We're not changing the data. We're not updating the data. All we're doing is just saying, hey, when you give me this data, when you showed me this data, can you please organize it in this way? So we could do ascending or descending. And then we'd be able to see like, you know, what is the most or the highest number? What is the lowest number? Things like that. Um, so to be able to use ascending and descending functions, we would use the order by. So for example, in SQL, we'd say select splat or everything from books table, order by cost descending. And that's going to tell us that we want everything from our table of books. And we want this to be organized, order by, the cost of the book, so how much we, the book is going to be, um, how much money it will cost us. And then we want to order it by descending so we can see the biggest price. Um, so it's probably going to be like, you know, a special edition hardcover or something. Um, so those are some other things that we can do in terms of organizing the data that we are getting back from our database. Now, SQL will have a number of other functions. These functions can be really helpful. It's good to start practicing with them. And when you are writing the different SQL commands, one of the things that I would recommend is wherever possible, just try practicing with them because having somebody just list off all of the different functions that you can do or filters that you can do or um, even just like, you know, some of the keywords like update, insert, delete, like, and, uh, you know, somebody explaining those slide by slide is probably going to honestly be kind of boring. So the best thing that I can recommend is actually to go practice with it and go see some examples of what those SQL queries are going to look like and try them out. Try changing. See what happens. Try it on a really small database, such as one of the databases that um, sort of small examples I've linked in my website, like the, you know, SQL Sandbox or, um, you know, W3Schools has some testers, database stuff, things like that. Um, because that kind of playing with it is one of the best ways to learn what's going on. There are so many that unless you work with databases all the time, it's probably going to be really difficult to memorize them all. It's better that you start to have a basic idea of how they work, how they're put together, what it sort of looks like when it does work, what it looks like when it doesn't work so that you know how to do some troubleshooting and what resources you may need to be able to get more information. Now, a caution that I have for this, the type of SQL that you're using will affect the functions, what they are, how they're labeled and how they're used. So this all kind of goes together. 
It is important that you know the general form that the queries are going to take. It is important that you know some of the basic syntax of how things are put together. Like, you know, for example, don't forget the semicolon at the end because that's really obnoxious to try to troubleshoot if you don't realize it's supposed to be there type of thing. But trying to memorize every single SQL function that's out there for every single SQL dialect is probably going to be an exercise in frustration. It's better to just get to know the ones that are going to be used most frequently for the situation that you're in. And if you're just practicing, just practice on a bunch of them. Um, on my website, I have uh, a list of some examples, the W3 schools, you could just go through the top, you know, 15 or whatever. Um, and then I've also linked here a SQL dialects reference so that you can see some examples of different functions and what the functions looked like by dialect. So as a reminder, SQL in general, there's the SQL standard, but there's also different other varieties of SQL that we'll call dialects. And the difference is going to be usually relatively minor and just related to the syntax. But it's important to know which one you're going to be using. So my example. So let's say you wanted to find the natural logarithm of x. So standard SQL says that it's going to be ln x, which you may remember from some math courses. ms SQL says it's going to be log of x, my SQL will actually take ln of x or log of x. So it's important that you know the dialect that you're using and the function that you're trying to aim for if you are going to try some of these out. Now, the last thing is how SQL queries are processed. So when we have SQL queries, you'll notice that there are some, I'm going to call them keywords in the query that are going to be capitalized. Those keywords are going to change what the query is going to do. The pieces that you'll add in, such as, you know, the table or the column or whatever, is going to change where those pieces, uh, those commands are going to be run on. The order that those commands are going to be run is in this particular order. So from and join are going to be the first thing that runs. Then it's going to be where, group by, having, select, order by, and then limit. Now, an important note. You'll notice that you have seen multiple examples of queries and you've done hopefully some practice with the queries, but not all queries are going to have all of these things. There are some things that all queries need to have, such as select and from, um, but they don't necessarily have to have, for example, limit. You know, I don't think I've used limit in any of the example queries so far, and I've only used order by in a couple of the example queries, but I've used select and from in every example query because it, you have to know what you are picking and which table you're picking it from. So it's just what order that that's actually going to be processed in. So that's how to put together some more complex SQL queries. Um, I hope this was helpful and I hope you're all having a lovely day.